Hi, my name is Matt Walsh. I'm the founder and CEO of Splish Naturals. I recently attended Carl Dakin's Motivated Money Bootcamp. As my company begins to launch its crowdfunding campaign for upwards of three and a half million dollars, I can't say enough about the class, what I learned, and how much I recommend it to any business looking to raise capital. Have you ever wondered what it takes to successfully raise money? I have worked with hundreds of capital campaigns across dozens of industries, and I'm here to share with you proven methods for raising money in record time and at the lowest cost, while also obtaining capital at the lowest price. My name is Carl Dakin, and welcome to Motivated Money. Hello, this is Carl Dakin with the Motivated Money Podcast. This is where we talk about entrepreneurs and small businesses raising capital, uh, and we try to figure out how to do it quicker, faster, cheaper. And if we can, uh, cheaper applies not only to the cost of raising capital, but also to the price that one may pay for the capital. And to do this, uh, we use my method, the motivated money approach to raising capital where we try to focus on those people who are most likely to make an investment and those people are stakeholders. These are people who stand to benefit regardless of whether or not they make an investment into your organization. So if they have that benefit, that value coming to them from your success, then it's only natural for them in their own self-interest to consider making some of their resources available to you uh, so that you can give them even greater benefits. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to be talking today with Michael Shun. Uh, Michael, um, if you would, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Michael Shung. My friends call me Mikey, and I'm the co-founder of Centered. So it's what it sounds like without the vowel, C-N-T-R-D. And my job is to help uh, people and uh, people incorporate academic research through games and workshops. So like having been in strategy research and management consulting, I'm just like been super interested in how to like really successfully like get people to actually implement the strategy that I have come up with. But um, that's kind of that's kind of what we do. Well, and, and that's important. Uh, and, and something that I often talk with uh, people raising capital that uh, they they often kind of have all these blind uh, acceptances of this is how you raise capital, this is who I raise capital from, and uh, they really don't understand uh, or have a strategy for this particular capital campaign, uh, meaning that they, they aren't looking at what they're trying to do, they're trying to fall within whatever rules they think uh, control them in raising money. And the other problem uh, from a strategic standpoint is it's very common for an organization to have to raise money two, three, four, or five times as it goes from start to some degree of right. maturation. And they don't think of the outcome of this capital campaign and how it's necessarily going to impact a later capital campaign. So at the end of the day, when uh, a person is ready to sell off their company or they want to buy out their investors, the, you want to make sure that when the dust settles, you still have something that's large enough and valuable enough for all the time, sweat and tears that you put into it to justify the entrepreneurial path. So uh, strategy is very, very important from my standpoint. What, what do you think um, a person should be thinking about when they start framing strategies for raising capital? I think one of the most common mistakes with strategy is that uh, you get all these like internet articles or like um like tiktok videos about strategies like you should apply this strategy or like if you don't do this you won't be successful and i kind of want to compare it to my experience with taekwondo so i did like 11 years of taekwondo and for those that don't practice or like my family and friends when they think of taekwondo they think of like you know i can do a 360 kick i can do roundhouse kick i can do axe kick I can do side kick. I can do, I, I cannot do the 540, but I always want to do the 540 kick. And, um, and, and that's wrong, right? Cause that's just a bunch of different kicks. And a lot of times when we're given different tactics or abilities to do different things, 
we think in terms of these like little things that we do, but um, if you really learn Taekwondo the right way, it's really understanding like kind of the philosophy behind that particular martial art. Um, in Taekwondo, um, in that particular martial art, which is from Korea, and the whole idea is that your leg is the longest part of your body and you can ger generate a ridiculous amount of torque compared to your hands or something like that. And then through that, um, you can do like uh, maximize damage if you can go fast uh, with your kick. And so everything's built off of that roundhouse kick. And all of a sudden, if you take that perspective, doing Taekwondo, the strategy behind it is to find ways for me to land a nice, clean roundhouse kick. It might be an advanced roundhouse kick, like a 360, but in the nonetheless, it's really about landing that roundhouse kick. So how is that different than just like a bunch of different lists of kicks? Um, in strategy, in real life, you kind of also want to not just do random sets of things with no organization, but you want to come up with some sort of strategy that's coherent. And I think what really ties it together is like you kind of have a theory or philosophy um, behind that problem solving process. So that's kind of what I think. What What do you think, Carl? <laughs> it's kind of weird. No, uh, analogy. I, I think I think you're correct that we we too often engage in a set of activities or an activity. Uh, without fully understanding what we're doing or fully understanding the consequence that will come out of that particular act. And uh, and so as as I'm using the motivated money uh, method to help people raise capital, uh, we go through an eight-step process. And, and part of that process is, one, talking to the right person. And uh, so the first issue is, so everybody has a tendency to go out and talk to anybody who has money, who has a checkbook and say, you know, you have money, so you should give it to me because I'm an entrepreneur. And and at that point, 98% uh, of the time when you're talking to an angel investor, you're going to get turned down. It's a terrible statistic, but you're wasting time talking to people who are never going to care, never going to invest. And, and I've had people go, but you don't know if they're going to invest. I go, yes. That's why you shouldn't do it. <laughs> you should only talk yeah. to those who you know uh, will talk to, who you know will invest. And uh, and then we, we get into all the other things, which is, you know, you should be raising enough capital to hit your next two or three milestones that are all moving you towards your goal. Everything starts to synchronize between why are we raising capital and how we raise capital and from whom we're raising capital. Yeah, that, that's why I love the analogy of using martial arts as a description of what strategy is. Because it's just like if you're the biggest kid in the playground, if you have a lot of money, if you have a lot of cash, you have unlimited customer and like um, there's no competitor, then like strategy isn't very interesting to you because you're just going to beat everyone up right but um where it's really interesting is when you start have to start like making um choices uh and trade-offs and um you have to invest in capabilities and stuff like that like that's where martial arts are a really good example because it's just like you know i can actually win by not being as big as the next kid but i'm leveraging resources training and philosophy and and, and knowledge to um, get better <laughs> at this rather than just re relying on raw strength. It's nice if you're still bigger, right? It's always nice to have more money. But I think, especially of the audience of this podcast, I think we're working with like very limited amount of money, time, effort, and energy, and also just kind of fuel tank <laughs> emotionally, right? So you want to um, get very disciplined <laughs> about how you go find money and have and that requires you to have a really strong philosophical underpinning behind why you need that money before you even come up with a strategy on how to get that money. No, it, it, it's a very uh, good observation. Uh, sometimes I've talked to entrepreneurs who um, want to go out and start a business but may not have any background or experience. And uh, somehow uh, the, the myth in the culture is that I'm an entrepreneur. Everybody should give me money because I'm an entrepreneur. And um, then we have other people who says that well, we're going to use other people's money. So I don't care how much money I spend because it's not my money. And in, in, in effect, it comes across as a disrespect for the sources of capital 
and and it makes you very nervous about giving that person any money at all because they, they don't seem to care. Uh, but uh, yeah, right now, uh, one is, uh, in my mind, you want to spend as little time and money raising money because it's a distraction from your primary business. It, it's not exactly. going to necessarily help you achieve your mission, fulfill your goals, all those kinds of things. A second thing is that uh, almost all of the programs that talk about raising money assume that you're going to be a high-flying unicorn and someday and you're going to be worth billions of dollars. And therefore, any kind of time and money you spend a uh, waste doesn't matter because it all be paid back in the end. But what um, 98, 99% of the businesses out there who need capital, uh, they basically aren't going to earn a large profit margin. They're not that kind of a company. They're not going to scale tremendously. They're not going to have fabulous margins. And the consequence of that is they cannot give up to uh, an angel investor a high rate of return. They have to give them something else. And, and we've talked about that in the episodes on crowdfunding and structuring offerings, where you start adding in benefits as being a stakeholder, but also rewards in the term of your products or discounts of products. The, the other thing, which uh, I think is becoming more critical day by day right now on strategy is that we are in a recession. And, and I have argued with people about whether we're in a recession or going into a recession, we'll have a recession. But in the capital industry, if you look at all the stats, uh, the capital industry is in recession, even if the rest of the world thinks it's everything's going okay. There's less money available uh, it's at a higher cost. Uh, there's higher criteria for qualifying for capital and sources of capital that might have been available last year aren't available right now. So uh, the, the discernment of who do I talk to, where do I raise capital from becomes an even more uh, important strategic issue as I see it. Yes. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. So um, how would a company commonly go about creating their own strategy? What, what would be the, the fundamental elements of here's where I am, what do I do? Yeah, so going back to the, the Taekwondo analogy, right? You um, Their philosophy is to use the longest part of the body to generate a lot of torque. And um I think where you really start, I know this is super like, it might not seem as exciting, um, but a good old SWOT analysis is really where you should start, right? Um, I mean, like they teach this in every single business school. And there's a reason why you teach that because that gives you kind of a good framing <laughs> on what is going on. But um, so that's so what what is a SWOT analysis? SWOT analysis is just basically acronym for the following words, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And um, the idea is after you list all these things on all these lists, you want to look at the points of leverage. So what can I do better than other people given this these circumstances and capabilities and processes I have? Um, once you kind of have a good idea of what those things are, you kind of go back and like push away the SWOT analysis <laughs> and then come up with a, a core kind of like a problem to solve and how you're going to solve it. And that's what I call the strategy. Um, so it's like what um, in Taekwondo that is like, you know, using really a lot of torque or like in other martial arts, it's about being able to grapple people really well or being able to use other people's weight against you or in boxing it's about being so able to have very fast uh, flex, um, uh, reflexes and being able to punch people. But you need to find your own kind of like uh, modus operandum, like being able to find a way to prioritize. That's what a philosophy really is, right? So like kind of, kind of like in order to... Uh, I will just kind of phrase it in a way like in order to win, I need to do the following. So that's kind of like the premise of the strategy, but it really, really is a frame around what you own, what you're bad at, what you're good at, and what is going on in the world. What is uh, what what makes it really advantageous for the industry and the stuff that you want to deal with and what makes it really, really threatening 
for your company. And then inside that context, then you kind of come up with a philosophy and a problem to solve. Yeah, so what I, I, I commonly, when I'm crafting an uh, offering proposal, I will start off with a statement of a problem that exists. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I, I do that because uh, that's what I, I'm concerned about, but it also helps the investor to uh, identify with who I am, whether they care or not. And, and whether they care is all, all important on whether they're going to invest or not. And, and that's part of the reason that under the motivated money approach, when I can show how they benefit from the success of your organization, uh, you're out killing the dragon, as I use the fairy tale analysis. But who cares about whether the dragon is killed or not? Because if they live in the, you know, over the mountain in another uh, village, then they don't care and they're not going to invest. Um, if uh, they benefit from the dragon, uh, in some way, uh, then the, actually they're your opposition. And, and so you start with that basic premise as you, as you framed it, you know, who are you? Who cares? Uh, why does anybody care if you succeed or not? And, and if they do care, then breaking that down and doing that analysis now gives us a very rich framework yeah. to say, who's likely to write me the check? Yeah. And I think if you talk to, I don't know what your experience with working with people who are raising money is, but my experience while I'm doing consulting is when I tell them about strategy, there's like, that's great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's go and sit down, write it down on the whiteboard. And then they go back to their own work and they throw all that out the window. And I, it's like, that's been like the biggest question. Like actually the thing I'm actually trying to solve my, um, in the way I consult and that's changed over time because of it. But I think, the temptation has always come with um, going back and going to solution mode as opposed to diagnosis mode. I think most of the strategy problems I've seen with most businesses is that they just look at solutions out in the market and then within their peer group and they just start working <laughs> without really, really having a good diagnostic of what's going on but like really like it's worth it <laughs> to slow down really understand the nature of the problem and a lot of, a lot of it is actually more passive than most people think it requires to slow down and ask questions and like listening to things and watch as opposed to like keeping up feeling like you need to work on the problem but i think a lot of entrepreneurs especially people who select themselves into this industry have this kind of busy body kind of a thing Right. So they just always want to be working on solutions. But I think most of the strategy problem I have is they're not working at the right solution in the first place because they were working on the wrong problem. So but if the if yeah. the solutions don't match the problem, then you're not having a good strategy. Um, so, yeah, it's all good in theory until people get tempted to go solve, um, solve, pro uh, solve problems that don't exist. Oh, it, and, and yes, um, I've, I've worked with hundreds of businesses in raising capital, and um, I, I still raise the question, why is it when an entrepreneur starts to raise capital, they forget everything they know about marketing? Um, yeah. You know, when, when you create a new product or service, you typically go in, you know, what are the features, characteristics, what's the outcome, who cares about this, who would buy the product, is there enough value? They go through the, all that intense analysis, or they don't, which they should have, back to your, your point. But when they go to raise capital, they, they assume that anyone with a check is a viable investor candidate uh, when they're not. Uh, <laughs> it really gets down to, you know, well, who's going to gain the most from writing me a check? Well, a person's getting only a return on investment can get that same return from all the other businesses offering a similar return. But if uh, uh, this person happens to need you to fulfill their mission, their goals, uh, to advance their company, their organization, then they get all this greater benefit. And that's the low hanging fruit. That's what we're working towards. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. As, as an entrepreneur myself, um, there is a tendency to say, if I'm not working, I'm not getting anything done. Uh, but a lot of the work is a waste. Uh, if I go out and stop everybody on the street and say, would you invest in me? Would you invest in me? And you invest in me. Uh, I, I joke that the guy on the street corner panhandling will have a higher rate of success than I would 
uh, if I go to the local angel investor group and start asking everybody to invest in me. It's just, it's one of those things where uh, people don't understand, they they forget uh, that uh, there is a rationale for marketing and it needs to be applied to raising capital. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a cycle that um, you kind of miss out. Like um, another analogy that I use with my clients is just like it's like breathing. You need to take out the carbon dioxide before you take the next, next breath. <laughs> and um, and and it's just so tempting to just go into problem problem solving mode before you really, really, really get down to the root cause. Or if like, especially in like the context of raising money, it's like, why do you need this money? Why do you need it now? How would you need that money? And what form? And what are you giving up to like to have that money? But there is some like um, vanity metric thing going on here with m raising money. Sometimes <laughs> so it's like it's it's my pet peeve in uh, in in the venture capital world where you rate success based on the amount of money you 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 raise but to me it sometimes it kind of feels like it's like well we're just breaking people based on the amount of money they're able to swindle but like, it's not it's 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 a good it's a, it's a signal but not a good necessarily a clear measure of success right well right the, i mean um that's another element in the strategy and, and one of the steps in the, the motivated money method is we talk about strategizing your offer uh, we talk about how it fits into your goals, how it fits into your investors' goals. Uh, and and quite often you'll see entrepreneurs saying, well, I need to raise $3 million. I go, is that all the money you're ever going to need? And they go, yes. I said, well, let's break it down into stages tied to your milestones, tied to reduction of risk, because I want to give up the least amount of equity or ownership um, so uh, at the end of the day, I have more left over for me. If I ask for all that money up front when it's high risk, I have to give up most of my company to get it. Not, that's not my outcome I'm looking for. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So um, and, and trying to then move forward, once we know that we're going to solve a problem and we bring the solution that properly matches, this is fitting the square peg in the square hole uh, solution to match a problem, uh, then what would be the next things we would want to consider in, in framing a strategy to, to go forward? You know, you are 80% there once you have, I think the, the biggest mistake that most people make is just in the diagnostic part. And it's once the diagnosis is made, the steps to take is kind of obvious, but the part where like to get the water down the road, so to speak, that people have a lot of trouble with is actually translating that to the rest of the organization. So like you might have a strategic buy-in and you know what to do um, and you're handing out all these orders down the chain of command, but um if the people who are making discretionary decisions inside your organization don't understand the strategy as well as you do, or you don't have the ability to communicate that strategy as well as you should, then what happens is um, several things could happen. Self-interest uh, definitely plays a role in this space. And that's, yeah, that's that, that's the diff that, that should be built into your strategy in the first place but like that that will definitely come in and but also just kind of like um one of the games i'm designing right now it, it really addresses this problem when people say the word grow or when people say the word compete they don't all mean the same thing i guess like send surveys uh, to executives in the same company that works together a regular just fortune 500 man like <laughs> these are like the mba trained people that knows all the same terms at least from class and now they're running this huge company uh one of the biggest supply chains um in the in the in the country and <laughs> they were just so surprised on how each person from different departments thinks so differently from about growth of course the cfo wants to control and save money and uh, uh and, and uh, all about the roi of course the vice president who's assigned to, you know, run the whole thing is really interested in creating new product categories and revamping the digital thing. Of course, the marketing guy is going to be very competitive and really looking outside in the market. 
And all of those people will look at gross very, very differently. So I don't know if I'm taking too much stuff, but I think it's really important. I'm just to demonstrate like the differences in different people's view. So how do you really solve that? Well, you need to first make it very simple, <laughs> strategy very simple. But what you need to do is communicate, measure, and then revisit. So like most people think that strategy is something like I do in like a five-year planning meeting and then I like, walk away and then revisit in five years and then we're good. But that, that, no, no, no. You, you come up with that five-year planning meeting of a strategy, assuming you've done a really good diagnosis and everyone's in a room and you like try to do your best to see how, how everyone interprets what the strategy is and have a workout and you design metrics behind that strategy. And then yeah. and it doesn't really need to take five years, like literally like come back and revisit it in a month <laughs> with the, the yeah, discretionary I, I, decisions. <laughs> right. I, I will share that, you know, when I am leading a project um, and I'm, I'm leading about half a dozen right now, um, I, I typically will start our, our weekly meetings, uh, not our five year meetings, but I'll start our weekly meetings with, OK, here's why we're all here. <laughs> and you know, restate the outcome uh, that I want to achieve, uh, so that that starts there. And then I kind of go through everybody in the group and go, uh, "This is what I think you're working on this week. How is what you're working on going to advance us towards that outcome that we're looking towards?" It, it's kind of like constant realignment of uh, you know your your task for the week is supposed to get us closer to this outcome I'm looking for. And, and and then if something happens, which happens all the time, that changes how we go about doing it. And I says, OK, how are we doing it differently this week than what we thought we were going to do last week? Uh, that still gets us back to this goal. And, and it's like a drum beat uh, where, you know, I'm, I'm in the background like a drummer. Keep, you know, saying this is where we're going. This is what our outcome needs to be. And, and then working with everyone to make sure that as you say, we're all working in the same direction and not working at cross purposes or wasting time or going off on weird tangents because it happens. If you if I don't have this constant communication and verification validation that they're doing what I thought they were doing, then I know next week we get to do it all over again. <laughs> yeah, that core philosophy behind why you do what you do is super important and that everyone needs to understand. This is something you have to kind of check in. Uh, check in almost so constantly and um yeah and and another thing that i want to mention is that like a general in the battlefield it's not like they come up with a plan and they stick to it 100 percent, right but the core philosophy on how to win the war remains the same makes any sense like the, the circumstances might change your um opposing player might uh, do something weird and you need to respond to it immediately or like the you know investors do something weird and you need to uh, react to that but um you have to come up first of all like diagnose the problem really come up with like well i'm gonna not win battles i'm gonna win the war and i'm gonna win the war by really leveraging this capability for this opportunity out in the market. And if there's nothing that you can say in, along that <laughs> that line of logic, then you're just doing something that everyone else can do, either that or something that is really hard to achieve. Yeah, no, I, it, um, early in my career when I was practicing law, we would write a contract, kind of like your five-year strategic plan, and we'd start implementing the contract and and then things would change oh. and and <laughs> my rec yeah my recommendation was if you're going to change it then write it out do a formal amendment as this is the new way we're going to perform this we would see contracts that had you know there are three years out of date that had no relationship to what was actually going on and then if something did fall apart uh it was a mess and 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 to me that's the same way as uh, you know they, a lot of people say we don't need a business plan and I, I say BS to that you clearly need a business plan but the business plan as you described it has to be ultimately flexible adaptable you have to have fallbacks built into it so that you keep focused on your outcome you're working towards and not get caught up in in the day to day things which may or may not be getting you where you want to go. 
Yeah, let me give another example for this, because I think this is a strategy is something really abstract, and I just like throwing examples in these kinds of things. And um, one example is that um, I want to throw out is like for perhaps like a company like Walmart, you know, like, you know, great values, saving every day. And something nice, a nice thing about their strategy and and their kind of slogan and everything is that if I'm marketing, I understand exactly what the implication is for my marketing. I'm like, cost is important. And communicating that cost saving is super important. If I'm in HR, I also understand that human capital turnover is like a really big problem. Like a good strategy should should be interpretable. So it, it's like it doesn't tell you what to do at what time. Even a company as like structured as Walmart with their like super tight timing, just in time, like stuff like uh, being legged up and their, uh, you know, full truckload and like coming up with like and keeping track of everything, even something as that structured, their strategy is actually extremely flexible. Something as vague as we're going to save cost <laughs> by, um, by, um, by using data. That's like literally basically kind of like their strategy, like the, they have really good data and they're going to try to save as much cost as possible. But the nice thing about good strategy and how, why we need to communicate all the time is that your marketing person needs to know it. you uh, no, it's like that survey I talked about earlier. If you don't communicate that or your strategy is not clear enough, everyone's all, go, all going to do stuff that they're going to be trained in. Of course, the CFO is going to care about keeping the money safe. <laughs> right but 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 to what extent but to what end you know what was the point of saving all this money um and i think i think you know like a good strategy should have the quality of like keeping that cfl to do their job at the boundary that they're supposed to do it at yeah yeah no um this is uh it's very important uh at, at the the whole business level uh, to have a strategy. And then as we start raising capital, we have to have a strategy just for raising capital that is part of the larger strategy of exactly. the business. Yeah. Uh, we're, not, we're not raising capital just for fun because it's generally not fun. <laughs> well, if everyone else is doing it, you know, like yeah. sometimes it feels like we're raising capital because like uh, I, I'm doing software. So apparently everyone in software is taking money. So I have to get money, <laughs> which is not necessarily true all the time. No, it has to, you have to come up with a strategy and in the capital and the type of capital you get will depend on what your strategy is. Right. So and, and that's actually that's going to save you a lot of time and money. Right. By um you know a lot of times your strategy is less about what you will do more about what you won't do <laughs> no, it, it, it's true um um we're putting on this boot camp uh, i present on raising capital called the motivated money boot camp and and I, as always as an entrepreneur we get into arguing with ourselves what's the right fee for this this boot camp and knowing that some people won't be able to afford it but also looking at the value uh, that's there that uh, no matter how you look at it, the person who goes through the boot camp is going to save a high multiple of the cost of the boot camp. And uh, and so uh, same thing here is we're talking about what what is it that you don't do is where your savings is at. Uh, don't talk to the 98 people who are going to turn you down out of 100. Talk to the one or two that that are highest probability. We We seek to get our top 10 list, as I call it, the ones mm -hmm. that are most motivated know why they're motivated, how to talk to them, what to communicate. Because at the end of the day, as I, I come and joke with uh, people, is that I'm looking for somebody that loves me more than I love myself. <laughs> they they need me, want me. I, I'm part of the solution to their problem. And, and therefore, you know, my organization deserves all the resources that they can get to me because I'm helping move them forward. And, and if we can get to that point of uh, making that clear to the person we're talking to, and that's a true and accurate statement to a particular investor candidate, it isn't if they're going to invest, they're going to do what they can in their own self-interest to get you the resources you need because they're technically funding themselves. Yeah. And, and that's where everything comes together. Well, Michael, uh, we're getting to the end of today's time. Uh, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you and start building their own master strategy for their organization or their capital campaign, how would they get a hold of you? 
Yeah, you can either email me at michael at centered.us, so C-N-T-R-D dot U-S, but I also produce a bunch of like TikTok and Instagram content um, with videos of the discussion examples. I just love giving people examples on strategy. And if you really think that strategy is like really an abstract thing, like I really highly suggest, suggest that you just come and follow me and I'll just give you tons of example. And after like a month, you're going to be an expert from all the content and you can find me, the user handle is the same center.us. So Michael at center.us or for my TikTok and um, Instagram accounts, Mike, uh, just center.us. Thank you, Michael. And, and thank you to everyone who's listening in today. Uh, I commonly like to allow our listeners and viewers to have a little bit of a homework assignment. And um, I would go back to your current business plan. And, and if you are building a capital campaign plan and ask yourself, you know, what is the problem you're solving? And is what you're doing actually solving that particular problem? And, and then actually, I'm going to throw another little zinger in there. Let's go, could you do that better? Uh, is there a way to do it quicker, better, faster? Uh, because that is part of your competitive advantage. And it also improves the likelihood of your success. Uh, so, so keep that in mind. And, and thanks to everybody for listening to today's uh, episode of uh, the Motivated Money podcast. Take care. Thank you for listening in to Motivated Money. If you like this or any other episodes, make sure to leave a rating and review the show. We love to hear your feedback and want to make this the best possible show for you. Also, if you like this episode, make sure you share it with someone you know who's seeking to raise capital. They will appreciate learning what you now know about raising funding. I'll see you on the next episode of Motivated Money.